Okay, so this morning I want to share scripture with you. And um, the amazing thing about this portion of scripture, let me just open this quickly because there's something I just wanted to, to check here or just have on hand. Uh, cool. Right, so, so the portion of scripture that I'm going to read is sort of nestled in between um, in Mark, uh, yeah, Mark 9, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up a, a mountain, and he goes in, uh, to, to, to pray and worship, and before them, he is transfigured. His body changed, and then, you know, Peter's response after this is, Wow, Lord, let's build three tents. One for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for you. And, and when I read that, I thought, yeah, isn't it so true that often when we encounter supernatural things, when we encounter a supernatural God, we try and make space for it in the physical. And Peter had this awesome privilege of seeing Jesus in a completely different way. And I'm sure that it would have radically changed his life. Definitely at John's. Definitely at James's. Because I don't think you can stand in the presence of God like that and walk away and still be the same. In any case, that's, that's the first sort of scenario that, uh, that happens there. And then uh, we have the passage that I'm going to read. And then after that, um, we just see uh, where Jesus actually then predicts his death. So we've got a transfiguration. We've got our story. And then he, we got him where he says, okay, I'm going to be handed over and I'm going to die. It's kind of, you know, an interesting space where we find this portion of Scripture. So let me read it to you. And I'm going to read out of the NIV version. It's Mark 9, verse 14 to 21. You're welcome to, to get it in your Bible. You don't have to look at it on the screen, but you're welcome to, to read it with me. When they came to the other disciples, so this is Jesus, James, uh, and John, and Peter coming down the mountain. So they're coming to the disciples. They're, they're walking into this scenario. Now, now think of this. They've just been on the mountain. They've just seen amazing things. They walk into this. When they came in, uh, to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Hello. As soon as all the people saw Jesus... They were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to him uh, to greet him. Uh, what are you arguing about uh, with him about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it, it seizes him, it throws him, in, uh, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Okay. Um, can I remind you, this is Jesus' disciples. You know, we, we had the transfiguration. This is at the end of Jesus' ministry. So undoubtedly, the disciples have seen incredible things at this point. Right? So they couldn't drive it out. And then... Jesus answers very gently and lovingly. He says to them, you unbelieving generation. Ouch. Jesus replied, how long will I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? <laughs> Can you hear a bit of impatience there? Maybe. Like, you know, I expected your faith to be in a different place, guys. I mean, I've demonstrated for you so much. Really? I'm, a, I'm sort of at the end of my ministry. Okay. <laughs> At least, yeah. And then he goes, um, bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When, they, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. So this spirit knew who Jesus was. I guess the question is, do the spirits know who we are as the disciples of Jesus? Maybe just throwing that in there for uh, free this morning. Okay. Um, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, 
Now, now I would have thought Jesus would engage this. So Jesus first pauses. He gets some, some history here you know, from the Father. Um, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answers. Uh, it has often thrown him into the fire or the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus reply. If you can, is the question, says Jesus. Everything is possible for those who believe. So, I mean, even just the Father's question shows me that he did not know Jesus the way I think the disciples actually knew him. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that uh, the crowd was running to the, to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and dumb spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed and him violently and came out. The boy looked uh, so much like a corpse that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus has, uh, had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why, could we, uh, why couldn't we drive him it out? He replied, this kind uh, can come out only by prayer. Now the truth is here, in our lives, your life, my life, we face various kind of challenges, right? Are you alive? Are you awake this morning? All right. Do you face challenges? Okay, I must just check because I just need to know that I'm in good company. And like this father, can you imagine having walked with a son, lived with a son, uh, you know, seeing this happening to your son, any parent you will know that is a hard thing to witness. But this father has this desire to see his son healed, like many of us. Not just for our children, but even for our own situations. We want to see them healed. And listen, he obviously knew who Jesus was. He would have seen, and maybe, you know, he was at some point where Jesus was teaching and so on, and he thought, I must bring my son to this guy. Things are going to happen here. <coughs> so he brought his son with the expectation to, to see him delivered and healed, right? So he pitches on the scene, Jesus is not there. Jesus is on the mountain and he gets the disciples. But he knows the disciples because he knows the disciples have been with Jesus. So he is even confident to ask them to cast out this demon. And we read just now that that was not possible. Now I think some, in the same way many of us and many people today come to God with our things uh, maybe even to the disciples of Jesus Christ in this day and age. And because the disciples are not where they should be, uh, they walk away disappointed. But fortunately for this father, Jesus comes on the scene. And this guy asked, if you can. And the first thing Jesus does is he just corrects his theology. If you can. What kind of question is that, Mark? What? I mean, really, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? If you can is not a question for Jesus. Yet I think sometimes in a walk with him, we ask the question, Lord, if you can. We disguise it maybe a bit better. We go, you know, if it's your will, which is a good prayer to pray, by the way. But sometimes it's a bit of a disclaimer to ensure that we're not disappointed. So we, we put the if it's your will there so that if it's not his will, then, then ach, it's okay. From the disciple side, when this father came to them, they were probably quite confident that they could handle the situation. Only to realize they couldn't. I must say hats off to them for at least trying. They at least stepped out in faith. They did something. They engaged this. But they suddenly and quickly realized they need some more. They need more. 
They need more training. They need to, to and like Jesus said, to pray more. To be in the presence of God more. And similarly to these disciples, we, we face situations and events and people that will challenge what we believe, or rather, who we believe in. Because is that not the purpose of challenges and trials and things that come uh, against us? Is to actually challenge the reality of God in our lives. To challenge whether you truly believe in Jesus Christ. To challenge uh, the, whether you're going to trust Him to actually pitch and see things changed. And it's interesting, even after Jesus rebuked the demon and cast him out, what does the de demon do? He just throws one more tantrum. Violently convulses the son. I mean, it's like, like, I mean, when the guy's like, oh, not even Jesus could do this. Was probably the thought that went through one or two minds right there. When this boy is doing his thing there, or rather the demon is. And then he falls down and, and now he's dead. What are we going to do about this now? And sometimes when we walk with God and the devil throws his toy, toys in our lives and it looks like everything is dead, what do we want to do? Is give up. In that moment we give up and trust in God. And knowing that he can even raise the dead. How many of you have prayed for stuff and... And, 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 and you're praying, and you're praying, and, and, and you know, it's, and a good example normally is if, you've, if you're paying rent or you're paying a bond, and it's been one terrible month, the thing is the end of the month keep coming. <laughs> and then it arrives, and there's no money in the bank. Maybe just a quick testimony when... We moved down to Cape Town in, in 1997. Um, the day we left Pochestrum, the sale of our house, uh, our house fell through. And um, not a nice way to leave. So we had to rent it out again and put it back on the market and so on. And we got here. And when we got here, Loretta had work. I didn't have work. Um, we lived in a small little place where you had to go outside to change your mind. Um, it, it was it was quite a, quite an experience, and in that season, we obviously just having one salary. And her salary was uh, just enough to pay our rent in the place that we stayed and to pay the bond. And it took huh? wasn't enough for both. Wasn't even enough for both. Oh, see, the finance department kept track of this, but we couldn't pay this. So every month for how long? Eight months. Six months. Six months. Six months. Half a year. We didn't have enough. So obviously, I started doing all sorts of funky stuff. Uh, no. <laughs> that sounds very dodge. Um, I, I can say I tried many things. I became a rep, which is the last thing I ever thought I'll do in my entire life. Um, my average income in 1997 at that point was about 400 to 600 rand eh, a month that I brought in with a salary that I think was two and a half or something. And, and we were in trouble. So every month, the end of the month came. Every month, we had to trust God. And, and I remember my tantrum. When I the one day walked up to the ATM, put my card in the thing and said, I need 20 rand because I wanted to buy, buy uh, some bread. And, and the thing kicked out that stupid slip that says insufficient funds. I mean, who thought out that slip? <laughs> really? And I cannot tell you when I got that little slip, nah, something just snapped. I went home. I never planned to tell the story, but here it is. I went home and I had this groot pity party. I sat, we had a duplex thing, and I sat there in a chair and I cried like I haven't cried in my entire life. And I was angry with God. 
Why are you not meeting our needs? And you told us to come down to Cape Town. And look what is happening here. I can't find work. We don't have money. And I was crying and sobbing and everything. And I threw, threw my toys. I mean, I just went for first place. And when I suddenly, eventually rather, quieted down, the only thing God said to me, that I felt God said to me, was Quibus. In whom do you place your trust? Me or that bank? That ATM. And I realized I felt quite secure while there was money in my bank account. And the moment there wasn't, I fell apart. And then I repented. Because I had to shift my trust back to God in that moment. And the truth is, as we sit here this morning, you have faced this. You have prayed for stuff. You have trusted God. And just as you think things are going to come right, the devil convulses like big time. It looks like everything is dead. And then Jesus comes in. And he takes the boy by the hand and he raises him up. I want to ask you this question. If you can put up that next question for me. Was benet? Ah, right. And it's been raptured. <laughs> How would Jesus respond to what you believe or to your faith right now? As I read the story of this dad, I couldn't help but think if Jesus was entering my circumstances, my situations now, will he also say to me, you know, that, that what did he say? He called it, uh, 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 you unbelieving generation. Is, is that what he's going to call me out and say, Quivis, why, why don't you believe? Why don't you trust me? How long do I still need to, to help you with this? You're supposed to be a man of faith. You're supposed to know that from your history, how many times I've come through for you, you just have to turn around and look at all the, 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 the memorials in your life, seeing how God has come through, and yet... You sit with this thing and, and, and you're not willing to trust me? Ouch. How would Jesus respond to our faith right now? Your faith for your circumstances, your faith for this country, your faith for your family, name it, your work. How would Jesus respond to your faith? So how do we come, overcome unbelief? Because this is a very subtle, may I call it a disease, that creeps in, this unbelief thing. You know, so, sometimes it starts with, you know, maybe just a little bit of disappointment. Or, you know, you pray, but, but you don't see anything happen. So you, so you pull back in your heart. You're not in your faith anymore. You know, you, you're trusting God for something and, and things change and then... then Boom, it's back. And you go like, what's this now, Lord? And similar to that scripture um, that I read about in Malachi, we miss and we fail to see this invitation of a loving God just to draw closer. But we get disappointed. We harden our hearts. We walk away from God because He didn't answer the prayer. Excuse me, is He not God? Can He choose to answer a prayer or not? And even if he doesn't answer it, am I willing to still trust him? Or do I then demand by stamping my little feet that, Lord, you must answer my prayer the way I like it? <laughs> 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9 says this following, and this is how we overcome unbelief, I think. It starts off with a nice little two words there humble yourselves. Ouch. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. 
Firm in, the, in your faith. Firm in what you believe. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You know that last little sentence is so comforting. That I know I'm not alone. That I know you here. <laughs> we are all experiencing the same kind of challenges and suffering. You are not alone. Okay? But the things that I've underlined there. Humble yourself under His mighty hand. Not, don't humble yourself under anything else. Just under the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself under His mighty hand. Because like David says, may I rather just fall into the hands of the mighty God than into the hands of my enemy. May the mighty hand of God be upon my life so that things will be work out and play out the way He wants it to play out. But it means I need to humble myself. And then this little thing here that says casting all your anxieties on Him. Yeah, but Kobus, I don't have anxieties. I maybe have a few concerns. Frame it any way you like. He says, cast it in. Why? Because the truth is, He cares for you. He cares for me. You know, I think, I, I, I think I would truly love to have a full revelation of how much God actually does care for me. Because sometimes when I come to Him, I, I don't think I'm good enough. I don't really think I'm worth His time. You know, maybe God is busy with some more important stuff somewhere else in the universe. So, so I'm not worthy. If you were not worthy, He would not have sent His Son to die for you. Which He did. He loved you so much. And in verse 8, be sober-minded. In other words, in, in, in plain Afrikaans, you can't, you can't say it obviously. I mean, I think sometimes we get drunk on the wrong information. We get drunk by listening, studying, etc. The stuff that is clouding what God wants to do. Be sober-minded. And be watchful. You know, if you were in the army, Rolf, you would know this. No? You had to stand watch. And, and that in more intense the battle, the more awake you have to be in watch. I remember I was standing, standing at the general's gate, standing watch the one day. Ah, man, it was probably like 3 o'clock in the morning. Dude, I cannot keep my eyes open. So you learn to sleep like this. Because I was in this round thing. So I'm like, it's incredible how you can do this, just by the way. You would think your knees would buckle and you, you sleep like this. And when I opened my eyes, three o'clock in the morning, his car drove up to the gate. What's the <laughs> Nah, I tell you. I woke up. I literally woke up. I was like, and now I had to remember protocol. <laughs> Brain has shut down. <laughs> General at the gate. And I'm thinking, what do I do? <laughs> but you know, in the same way, the devil sometimes arrives at your gate. You don't expect him. You need to be watchful. You need to stand watch. Otherwise, you will steal, kill, and destroy in your life in my life be watchful why because that devil is prowling around he's doing his nightly thing and then I love verse 9 resist him resist him firm in your faith just tap someone there quickly just, just wake them up say hey listen don't tell him hey, hey listen resist him Achrie, jy is nie convincing nie. Eh? Firm in your faith. Firm in your faith. 
And then, Romans 10, 17, is the following, he says, so faith comes by. Ah, faith comes by. Faith comes by. Okay, faith comes by. Oh, so how does faith come? Uh, so what do I need? Ah, ah, I guess my question is, what are you listening to? And hearing through the word of God, through the word of Jesus Christ. The truth that will set me free. So how must I resist him? Firm in my? Okay, so how do I get my faith? Ah! You might not say, do you have ears? Oh, those ornaments. Mine is still ornaments. <clears throat> Revelation 12 verse 11, he says, so we're talking about how do I overcome unbelief, right? He says, and they overcame and conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. I guess when last have I told my testimony? How long, when last have I spoken of the greatness of God in my life? How long have I taken, uh, long ago have I taken back ground where the devil even has stolen is someone else by just sharing with him what God has done in my life? You have memorials a mile long. They are bullets in your belt. To take out the enemy. Because no one can argue with your testimony. <coughs> when you're feeling down, when you feel like everything is pushing in, it's pressing you down, just look for someone to tell them a testimony. <laughs> Find him say, hey, hey, you're honest. And me your you're proud, Pally. Can, I, can you tell you what God has done in my life? I don't care what's your situation, dude. I just want to celebrate what God is doing in my life. Jim LeFoon always says, when the devil comes against him, he starts going and he, and he leads someone to Christ and he tells a testimony or he prays for someone and then the devil goes, oh, oh, I need to sort out these fires. And then he leaves him alone. Overcoming by the word of your testimony. And they did not. Oh, this is, this is the part that, that gets me a bit. For they did not love their lives and renounced their faith even when faced with death. You know, that stand firm in our faith. This is how it plays out. It's where we stand even to death. Where we stand, and we keep on standing, which is Ephesians 6. And you can go read the, the, the whole portion there. But Ephesians 6 starts like this. Then, so then, take your stand. Take your stand. What happens when you stand up against something? Shall I use Caleb again? <laughs> you remember when we did this last time? Yes, okay. You know, when you stand up against the devil, he doesn't expect you to push back. He's quite happy if you don't push back. He's quite happy if you fall apart and start crying and, and do nothing. But, but when you push back, and like Jesus, you say, the word of the Lord says, or you tell that testimony, or you pray that prayer of faith, or you take authority in the name of Jesus. He is not expecting that. You see, it's similar when the father came to the disciples, that was challenged. Suddenly they had to live what they believe. They had to live what they believed, whom they believed in. This is where the tacky eats the tar. I wonder what will happen in this room where someone manifests right now. Are we going to have the faith? <laughs> I sincerely hope not. But we're all scared of it, isn't it? We're all scared of this spiritual manifestation. But the fact of the matter is, we have the authority. 
You see, if we get back to Mark 9, it's when we see Jesus, everything changes. The impossible becomes possible if we choose to believe. What He speaks, His word will change everything in your life. But I guess I need to be willing like the Father to say, uh, yes, my unbelief, Lord, help me to overcome it. I want to overcome my unbelief. And then can I close this by reading Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 14 quickly for us. And I want you, as I read this, to hear what your Father is saying over you. Because you need to meditate on these scriptures. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every sp spiritual blessing. Just tap someone quickly. Say every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Come on! Hello? So can you say that you are not blessed? No. Don't you dare say that you are not blessed. Even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. So if there's sin in your life, please get rid of it. Okay? Stop compromising. In love, He predestined us uh, for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Oh, come on! In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, man, lavishing is a good thing. It's not like a hiding. It's a lot of blessing. Okay? According, uh, uh, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him things in heaven and things on earth. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been pre, uh, uh, predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, was sealed with a promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Woohoo! Shosa Loza! I mean, come on! Does this not If this does not stir your spirit, if this not, does not get you wanting to wake up, then I don't know what will. This is the most awesome scripture. And God is just speaking over us. And similar to what I said previously with Malachi, God has got this incredible invitation for you and me just to draw closer. No matter what you face. Face. We need to turn to Jesus with life challenges. Stop turning to other things. Like that, Father, you don't need to have your faith sorted out when you come to Him with your problem. He didn't come to Jesus walking on water. He came in a desperate place for His Son. And when He realized his wrong paradigm, his wrong thinking in that with God everything is possible. He had to change. But he didn't have to arrive that way. So if you are battling with your faith now, that's okay. Just come to Jesus. You need to be willing to, for him to just challenge you and change you and teach you a few new things. And then 
settle in your heart. In whom do you believe? I guess, what do you believe? And then the last one, spend time in prayer and fasting in the word to be ready for every challenge.